Thank you. Here, yeah. Margot Dunbar Hessian. Thank you, Jack. Because she wrote a book about rock and roll that's along the lines of um, uh, Taylor Jenkins Reads, uh, Daisy Jones and Six, or Jessica Anya Blau's Mary Jane. But this book is actually loosely based on personal experience. I do have to say it is a novel, but she's here to talk, so let's welcome and give her a big aloha. Aloha! Oh, <laughs> All right, guys, one more time. Let's give her an aloha. One, two, three. Aloha! aloha. So good to thanks, see Zach. you. Know, we used to work together. At we used the, to work uh, together. We did a famous duet of um, <laughs> a song uh, that was part of her ex-husband, Ainsley Dunbar's journey uh mm -hmm. don't stop believing and wow. but thank god there was no social media oh yeah no we did <laughs> so, the first, like right. i was leaving the party like get get her back in here we're all gonna sing it together like, there there might have been oh, a, yeah. an adult <laughs> beverage or two oh yeah there were some beverages i think there was a little table dancing <laughs> there was <laughs> there might have been there might have been a rust or two but yeah, who's talking absolutely. we're not talking yeah, we're not talking. <laughs> that'll be the next one so margo dunbar hessian hessian yeah, I so glad to have you here because I know some of you know she's been working on this book for so long for I mean a decade at mm, least yeah, probably, or yeah. so and first of all the character Charlemagne Devlin has mm -hmm. the coolest name ever I think. <laughs> but I want you to I want you to if you could tell everybody briefly what it's about well um, since I was married to Ainsley I uh, had an inside view to that world that rock and roll world and as a writer that kind of colorful world that's really appealing and um, I really want to take some of the stuff I took from my life over years the different situations and stuff some of it from people I know and some of it I made up but I was kind of known for putting the she in shenanigans and um, <laughs> for being a little hot mess at times so I kind of wanted to take a hot mess character and kind of give her a good arc and um, and have her be married to the rock star and you know have her her life, all the trials and tribulations of doing that. So some of the stuff happened, but not in all the order. So I was able to combine people and timelines and stuff. So I had to make it a novel, but that gave me the freedom of, um, mm -hmm. of really being able to have a good story and pull, you know, put stuff in there. So. Did you ever think that you would write something like this when you're on the road with Never. Ainsley or something? Like that? Yeah, because I would have taken notes. You know? <laughs> I would have taken notes. And that's one thing too, is if you're gonna write a memoir, I'm like, okay, we're going back 20 years in some of these places, and I might have a, a great memory of something that went on, but I can't just go quote David Bowie or quote somebody, you know, exactly, and, you know, Neil Sean or something in for backstage, and it's like, you know, I just, I was looking at those little vignettes and things like that of true things, and doing it, because people are like, oh, why don't you write an autobiography? But it's just kind of, it's more little vignettes, and I really wanted to challenge my writing and to balance that tightrope, kind of walk that tightrope of hilarity and tragedy, because I wanted to make her like drug addled and, and addicted to drama and drugs. And I just wanted to make her have a lot of issues. And um, of course, I don't know anything about that. So, um, but, no. but you know, but, yeah, I'm just on the redemption, on the good side, no. Yeah. No, anyway, so I pulled stuff like that from my life and from others and so forth. And um, yeah, I just wanted to have somebody who was just a, a real mess at the beginning and see if I could help her uh, find her journey you know and create a path for that and that's really has to be a novel did you uh, plot the way or did she just did Charlemagne just take you on this journey um, I started out in a lot of different ways I started out as a thriller then I started out as like a romance <laughs> and then I would workshop it through the Santa Barbara Writers Conference and the LA one and the Southern California Writers Conference and I became um, not really confident in what I was doing and so every time someone would say you know what you should really open it here I would go oh okay and then I'd open it there now, you know you should really have this make this one the first part oh okay mm -hmm. and so I was doing a lot of that back and forth until I just said really what is the story you want to tell and um, you know and after I had married Ainsley I uh, I didn't take alimony because I wanted to stay friends and I had a good paying job and I'm like I'm good you know mm -hmm. But then the next year was 2008, and I lost my job, and I went down to zero. <laughs> and at 48, I had to move in with my mom up in Solvang in, in like a little twin bed. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was kind of like the fall was pretty, was pretty, uh, pretty, yeah, really. 
So I said, okay, you know, I would and just kind of pull myself up from there. And so from that, that's kind of the loose, that's where I started. I said, okay, let's just have her, I want to have her have everything and then we'll take it away and then see how she can navigate through whether she's going to get it back or what she's going to do if she wants it back, you know. Mm -hmm. um, with Ainsley and I, it was more of, okay, I moved on to a different thing. But with her, I really, hi, Wes, how you doing? With her, I wanted to, um, to you know, to be like have drama the whole time and yeah. so, uh, so even though my mom and I got along fine she is you know there's cantankerous stuff happening all the time mm -hmm. and so the, the I call it soaring to new lows because I take her down pretty good and when she thinks she's at rock bottom it's like collapsible floors they just you know she's so yeah up. and she's scheming and I, I think she's like a Lucy Ricardo meets Courtney Love <laughs> that kind of you know that kind of you know, it's kind of dates me but I really love I love Lucy and the scheming and all she has to do to get backstage with Ricky and then it ends up kind of working out without her whole plan her whole plan falls through and I really wanted to kind of have that character but have her be modern day with uh, partying and you know the parting stuff is backstage it's just like office supplies you know yeah. So, um, and I wanted to have the band um, rehabbed, and I wanted to have her be the wild one. So okay. it's coming in as uh, the band just got back from rehab, and she's coming in hot. hot. So okay. I wanted to kind of flip that, where most people get, uh, you know, the person comes in, and the the band, you know, gets the person, you know, into partying and stuff. So. So you mentioned Riders Santa Barbara Riders Conference mm -hmm. and two other conferences. So that means yeah. you've really worked hard at this, and. Then, like you before you read a little bit for us talk about your whole process because it took a number of years uh, it stopped for a while so if you can take everybody on the journey of how long and what it took for Margo to get this completed well I probably over a decade of working on it here and there there was uh, a time in 2010 when I did move up to the valley where I was like, I'm never gonna stay in this valley. I'm gonna go to Santa Barbara every day. I can't even be in a country quiet area. It was just very night owl girl. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I ended up loving it there. And I ended up becoming dog sitter and um, was able to move into these places and I was able to write a book there. And there I got a lot of peace and everything. So that was just having that environment was really helpful. And it's like my best worst thing ever. Because at the time you lose your job and all this stuff and divorce and you're like, oh my, you know, it's just going downhill. And, you know, somehow it turns out that that's kind of what I needed. Mm. But, um, but yeah, so I did that. That I had a nice block of time there. And then, um, and I did do an outline. Finally, when I was like, okay, what's it going to be? It's going to be a thriller. It's going to be romance, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so then um, I did do an, an outline and I really tried to follow that. And I tried to have a through line which is like um, trying to be somebody you're not leads to total self-destruction mm. or try or being true to yourself leads to personal freedom that kind of thing okay. so i kind of wanted to have that to see you know when she's going to figure that out and um and then have the scenes kind of go with that but uh, but a lot of it it was just a lot of fun to go back into that world and to pick out stuff that i'd seen and then be able to embellish it a little bit more and to make it so that i can Put words in those guys' mouths, or you know, in rock stars' mouths. But I, I couldn't do that if it was a memoir. Yeah. So. And you didn't uh, work straight through. You had a, a big gap. Yeah, I did have a stop. gap. I stopped for like um, I moved to Hawaii um, about six, eight years ago, and then um, right before that, uh, I just had issues with uh, family and stuff, and it was just kind of a it was a, just a tough time mm -hmm. of um, a lot of stuff happening, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I started working for Monty Schultz, who owns a conference. Yeah. So there was all of that. Then he started getting new music, and I was putting on concerts and stuff like that. I got very busy. And then uh, he bought a house in Hawaii and I moved over there. And then I started, I never moved out of state before. So boom, I was there. And um, yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of, uh, wait. I just waited a while. And during COVID, I kind of, you know, I was a healthy person and I was, paddling and doing all this early stuff and then during covid you know i kind of ran into this guy who <laughs> collected mm. he said he was outdoors we kind of like to hang at bars so i kind of got back into the nightlife <laughs> even over, over there yeah i was like oh you're a bar fly oh my god <laughs> so i did that and then i was like okay this is not why you're here and this is you know you're not getting stuff done and you need to finish your book and and that kind of stuff during covid so once that came out 
and um, the world kind of settled down and it wasn't like a, a big escape time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just said, okay, this is what you're gonna do. So, um, so now I'm with a totally big group of healthy friends. We paddle and we hike and we're up early, we're up before the dawn and, and my life has gone from, I say rocker wife to island life. So um, it's just a great, you know, that's for me personally, that's kind of my arc for me. And so um, with that, I had time to set aside and have my head be clear and not uh, distracted with other things. Cause you know, if I'm with somebody, sometimes I try just to be Mrs. Him, like I'll give up my stuff and I don't, you know, and the book is one of those things. So it's nice to, uh, to focus and get it done and just go, oh my God, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like the, you know, the whole project, just finishing the project. I thought I'd be on my deathbed going, why did you ever, you just all you did was sit and write that thing in your room for years. And you know, now it's just sitting on the computer or it's like, you're gonna, and I even had to put it in my will to give it, I, I willed it to another author who I like and I said to her, for her to finish it. I said she would do that. <laughs> I'm as like, just far so as I knew. you know she would. Oh, yeah, man, no, I was gonna leave her money and everything else and would she just rewrite I, you know, just write the ending and I don't know how it's gonna go but it was just so I could kind of die happy and know that it was gonna be out there somewhere and I'm like that's not gonna happen so just get it done well so. you know I'm gonna have to go and okay, finish sure. my novel right yeah, you, better. <laughs> you better in the meantime why don't you read for everybody? okay Thanks. sounds good okay so I'm gonna open it up so page three chapter one the 20 year comeback concert of British band Envious, yeah I know, Envious, was the most hyped in rock history until a rogue tiara from a fan's booze and blow infused blunder ruined it. Oops. Thinking back on that night, I realized it was really all her fault. The police motorcade's flashing blue lights and shrill sirens engulfed our limousine, ushering me, holy shit me, to the Hollywood Bowl with my husband's legendary band Envious. Our tinted windows ablaze with the last rays of a 2003 October sky. My dream debut as Mrs. Jubal Devlin fell on Halloween Eve, making this my best birthday ever. Sure, my year of scheming and killer high ideas got me here, but I was born on the night of mischief, so it wasn't my fault. I pinched myself as my jacked up brain spun at warp 10. Me, Charlemagne Lazour, now Mrs. Jubal Devlin, as the envy of the entire planet, even better, after 30 years, the envy of Clarissa Kilminer, my high school tormentor, Yule Town's number one fake Christian, and still the wormy apple of my own mother's eye. <laughs> Fabulous. Lit, leathered, and limoed up, at 42, I found freedom and home at last at this juicy dead center of a rock star sandwich. My new rocker life was finally in place. All systems were go and rocketing along. Well, that is until the, drug, until the drugs kicked in and my wheels came off. <laughs> my fangirl stomach churned with butterflies as I stole secret glances at my new family. The four famed bandmates kicking back in the limo's buttery leather seats. 20 years had passed since her last gig in 1983 and time had not been kind to the musicians. Their Aquanet hair, gone. <laughs> Chins, doubled. Six packs, kegs. Didn't matter. <laughs> to me, they would always be rock and roll legends of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And after a lifetime of being called a nobody, a never was, a social DOA, I wasn't just popular, I was with the band. <laughs> Clarissa could suck it. <laughs> the driver slowed as menopausal moms swarmed, I'll just start again. The driver slowed as menopausal moms swarmed our rock star cocoon like post-apocalyptic ants feasting on the Earth's last sugar cube. They climbed up and over each other, flabby arms flailing and muffin tops jiggling with each excited leap. Cranked up on Pinot Prozac cocktails, the hammered granny groupies clamored the barricades, hailing the reunion of their four British rock gods. And oh my fucking God, me. Nine months from now marked my 25th reunion at Yule Town High. With the money from this tour, Jubal and I would move out of the garage apartment and renovate his label's mansion. I'd arrive at my reunion not as the town's maternal tragedy, not the once back-braced teenage dweeb in a German dirndl dress, but as Mrs. Jubal Devlin. My life outrageously good. As my idols quibbled over the set list, decades of star-struck adrenaline mixed with secret, secret whiffs of nose candy 
ignited my inner spaz. My heart jackhammered against my leopard corset. Sweat pooled behind the knees of my red pleather pants. The limo's low ceiling snagged my tiara and its sealed windows coffined the stifled air. A sign above the bar read, no alcohol. Please, I needed a drink or five. Except here, drinks are off limits. Damn rock star rehab. Like my best friend Robin told me earlier, why'd they have to be such alkies and addicts in their day to ruin your party now? <laughs> Getting Jubal here costs you your 401k. Plus, it's your birthday, which means it's your time to celebrate. Robin was right. She was always right. I fished through the ice, pulled out a Red Bull, and swigged it down. Whoa, bad idea. My heart whirred, uh, clenching my throat. Crap, maybe I shouldn't have snorted Robin's blow. Sure, she was a lanky Danish coat hanger shoved in a messy mental closet. As a hot 11, if her issues didn't have issues, I'd have to positively hate her. Yet when her snort em up schemes helped me get Jubal back with NVS, she became my life guru. The limo eased past the smoky kitchens of backstage vendor tents. The loud clatter of the crowd, the smell of churros, tri-tip and beer wafted into the back seat. My stomach fluttered and my skin turned clammy. Needing air, I cracked the window. The rehab rocker stopped squawking and glared at me. My hand froze on the button. Jubal lunged over me. His tatted hand clamped over mine. His bejeweled dragon rings clinked my gold-plated wedding band. Charlemagne, you bloody high. <laughs> I stopped dead, hovering over the button while flipping my magenta hair over my dripping nose. Shit, could he tell? I wanted to tell him, yeah, I'm flying. <laughs> anyway, I tried to talk slower, but powdered lies machine gunned out of my twitching mouth. <laughs> Hi, m me, no, cra crazy, so crazy. <laughs> shut up, Charlemagne. I tried, but my guilty words kept looping. God, how could I shut off my cocaine Tourette's? <laughs> Jubal rolled his eyes and slid on his sunglasses. Yeah, we heard you the first seven times. I meant the window, love. He pinched my <laughs> belly roll. You cannot open it, chunky chicken, he hissed with a sinister laugh. Not my weight again. His bandmates exchanged awkward glances and shifted uncomfortably. Jubal grinned, clearly embarrassed of me, as he pointed to the closed window. Can't open it, the fans. He reclined his wig on the headrest and cooed, never relax, heiress. Wait one minute. I stared at my reflection in his foster grants. Let's just say his royalty income had slipped a notch, or maybe 10. Heiress? Mm. He cocked his head and his face flushed. Before he could answer, it came to me. Oh, heiress, because I'm now rock royalty. I hugged myself as those words spooned me. I took a breath and withdrew my hand from the window button as the band shot me the stink eye. Seriously, who were they to look down on me? After a decade of peanut butter and crack, the drummer was now more a whippet than a man. The bass player's mohawk and booze bloated neck mirrored a stegosaurus in a whiplash brace. <laughs> And the cirrhosis livered keyboard player had so many pink drops of Pepto in his white beard that he could pass for Santa after eating out a flamingo. <laughs> ah, but to my left sat my Jubal. Hello, perfection. Sure, at 60, his hair shone synthetic now, as did his cap veneers and glossy, derma-filled lips, but none of that mattered. He would always be my teenage idol. And that's how he starts. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> question yes did Ainsley Ainsley Dunbar her ex-husband as most of you know was the drummer of Journey Starship White Snake, White Snake as yeah, well. Zappa David Boyd did he blurb the book before he read the book no he read the book and then blurb he wanted to read it all right read what <laughs> Ainsley wrote I'll, I'll read what he said so and he's got a very good dry sense of humor he said great dark humor and all too true, reminds me of one of my ex-wives, Ainsley Dunbar, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame drummer, Journey. Nice. And I have another one in the back too. Um, I laughed my ass off through the whole book. I've lived inside the rock world and this book kicks ass. This story is all sex, drugs, and lots of heart. And that's Mick Meshbeer, guitarist for Alice Cooper. Ooh, Great. Nice. So that's that. So, what was your accent? Um, influenced by Ainsley. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and that's why I want to make him British. I mean, it's definitely when I think of who Jubal is, and Jubal is his name for when he travels. Oh, okay. He used to be Jubal early, 
And so that's like his secret name. So when he told me that, I go, oh, I'm totally going to call the, the main character Juba. And I'll make him a guitar player, but it's so him. Uh -huh. And so, uh, but it's not, you know, like I said, it's, it's inspired by him. And then I took things from our life that happened. I took things I made up and, and, uh, and things that happened to other people. But when I hear him, like, oh, I can't be bothered, love. I can't be bothered. Yeah. You know, he had more of a thing about, um, you know, it's work for him. And so yeah. he's like, I don't, why do you want to go to all these concerts and everything? And I would do a little scheming, you know, and say I was his manager or something and, and score the backstage passes and then tell him that the yeah. band people wanted him to be there and, and then he'd go. But, uh -huh. um, so, so that little scheming thing, there's a little truth to that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's, um, but for him, he was like, why would I want to come down to your office and watch you, you know, work on your computer all day. I go, it's not at all the same thing. <laughs> not at all. Being backstage with David Bowie in a concert, totally different, okay? So for him to not get, that was really funny. But he was always like, can't be bothered. So in your life, uh, your experiences, what, can you throw a few of the high highlights that, well, backstage with Bowie is probably up there. Yeah, it's up there. If you um, could share a few vignettes about that. Yeah, and what I'm going to do also on my social media, I have a business, like a book page, whatever. I'm going to, I'm finding photos. I just went through my storage and closed mm -hmm. it out. So I'm finding photos and I'm telling stories, little story, the Great. true stories there. Great. So that way I feel a little better than just uh, publishing something and then having it be, you know, whatever. So um, how do we follow you? Yeah, well, how it's do we so, follow It's so Margo. Yeah, it's so Margo because it's so Margo. Oh my God! So that's kind of my brand is all the shenanigans and stuff. So, um, so Margo is it's so Margo with the underscore on um, Instagram, and that's all here. So, so if you guys take this as business cards and bookmarks, the bookmarks are like a nice reminder to write a review if you can. But um, so anyway, so we're backstage at Bowie. And he came to the bowl. And David Boy asked um, his manager, what I did is I set up a website for Ainsley, right? And I thought, okay, he's, because I kind of wanted him to get, um, you know, with Journey, back with Journey, which he did for a while. And he, yeah. he didn't really want to do that. And I kind of put that in there yeah. and then got him to meet with the guys. But um, I was always looking to kind of get him out there. And I was in marketing, you know, but yeah. rock and rollers, he's like, we don't do this, you know? So I go, well, I'm gonna just make you a website and then I'll have a, a guest book on the bottom. Well, all it did was bring in all the chicks. From the yeah. It was like, hey, remember the time? I'm like, holy shit. So I mean, now they could find him. So I, told, I was like, oh God, so that totally backfired. But one of the things is that the David Bowie's manager um, wrote into the guest book and asked, Diamond Dogs was on his 25th year, and they asked yeah. Easy to write a foreword for that. Well, he was a coffee bothered. So I talked to him about it, and then I wrote it, and then he approved it. And so then when I sent it to him, I'm like, can we come backstage to the concert when he comes here? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, we'll put you on the list. So we go to the concert and um, watch the show, and then we're waiting backstage. And um, it's actually before you get into the it's, – it's right outside the backstage door at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. So there's Marilyn Manson, who's wearing, like, 50-inch black shoes, and his wife, Dita Von Teese. It's Margaret Cho dressed in a full China doll outfit and her girlfriend. And it's uh, John Cleese and his wife and Ainsley and I. That's it. It's like, what are you talking about? What year was this? Um, I don't, it was 25th year. It's probably 2005. So, I mean, I, you can look, we can look it up. But, um, so anyway, so we're standing there. And then I don't listen to... Uh, Marilyn Manson's music, but I knew it was popular, and I knew my niece would love to have me have a picture with him. So I said, hey, Marilyn, I love your work. <laughs> like, that's like the tackiest thing you can say to any artist. <laughs> it's like there's even a movie called Love Your Work. Like, yeah. So he knew that I was not a fan or anything, and I'm like, whatever. And, and I'm in like my, I have a white leather jacket on, and my hair is kind of bobbed, and it just looked like a suburban, you know, yeah. So anyway, so I take a picture with him, and then, um, he is, and we, I've had cocktails, you know, and so uh, he's, he's got his hair shaved on one side. This is before it was popular. Shaved on one side, and he's got one blue eye, one brown eye, and I was like, so what does it say in your driver's license? Like, what color hair? How can you have that? And then is, your, is your eye just, do you put the blue and the brown together? And, everything? and he was just like, I just hate her. <laughs> you know, and so, so anyway, so he was starting to talk kind of loud and, and about his concerts and just kind of, you know, be out there. And then the door opened, we go into the backstage, and David's not there yet. And he was just going on and on and on about 
himself and his stuff, and and um, and he had never met David. So David comes walking in, and um, he rushed him. He was like, David. And David looked around and goes, excuse me, Marilyn, but there's someone I'd like to talk to first. And he came over to us. So Aww. I was like, yeah. So, uh, and then I, I, he was really nice. He came up and he was like, uh, you know, he saw Ains, they gave him a hug. Because they were together four years. He did the Spiders from Mars tour. Okay. And they lived in London together and, you know, wore the groovy clothes. And, and uh, there's even a photo online that's Mick Jagger, David Bowie, uh, Ainsley was playing with Lou Reed and David Bowie, and Lou Reed didn't uh, know that, and they were sitting around, and it's Mick Bronson, Ainsley, and all these guys uh, sitting around this table having champagne and stuff, and Lou Reed had come over and was like, wait, what, why are you here? Oh, shoot, he's, because Ainsley played, I think, 15 different albums in that year of 74. But anyway, so um, he, he's wearing this cool jacket, and we, you know, they had just have great clothes. And so Bowie was wearing this really cool jacket with all these silver things in it and, and patches and stuff. And I was like, so nervous. So I'm like, uh, and drinking or whatever, but <laughs> whatever. So I was like, oh my God, oh my God, can I have your jacket? He came in, he came in with like his just t-shirt on and I'm like, oh, that jacket was so awesome. Can I have it? And he was just like, um, hold on one second. Let me, let me think about it. Ainsley. Do you think we should give Margaret your jacket? My jacket? Yeah. Do you think so? And they're like, well, what would she do with it? Oh, she'd probably wear it to the market. And I'm like, okay. So, um, so he finally they turn around and he goes, nah. Oh. <laughs> of course, it's totally a costume. You know, it's, like, it's a costume piece, you know. So, um, but anyway, he shook my hands and he said, it was a pleasure to meet you, Margaret. And um, very polite gentleman, you know, stellar. And then he turned to Marilyn Manson and he said, Marilyn, this is somebody you should know. And um, and he played oh. Diamond Dogs, the album that you and Marilyn plays Diamond Dogs for every show. Yeah. And so he, mm -hmm. but he was like turned that whole thing around where it was like okay. Wow. So then, um, yeah. And then I want to tell you that in the day when Ainsley would play with David Bowie, he would give him little David would leave little notes that said your playing tonight was extraordinary, mm -hmm. Ainsley. Thank you, David. Aww. And little white notes, and he has those all in a thing. Oh, okay. Aww, I found so those. Yeah. Wow. And uh, just a polite guy. And so he wanted him for Ainsley for his band. And, um, and Ainsley wanted to be permanent. But the two managers met. Yeah. And couldn't come to a money thing. And so it didn't happen. Oh. But the two guys wanted. So that's why when he saw him, he was like, oh, my God. You know, he totally wanted him. You know, it's been, it had been decades since they'd seen each other. So it was really oh. nice. And, uh, but cool. I didn't get the jacket. Oh, well. <laughs> We've got time for a couple questions if anybody would like to ask. Margo, a question about the book or experience or? Room, room. Oh, oh, hi. Hi. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Let's you milk free. Milk free. I was you. wondering when you started writing. When, well, I started writing a long time ago. I say when in my 20s, I was writing um, screenplays and um, I started writing a Simpsons like uh, teleplay and I was getting into um, writing workshops like you know I'd send it in and I'd win something to get you know, like it you know a contest and stuff like that so one contest I was like 28 and it was the writers workshop um, at Warner Brothers and so I went down to LA and there was like 30 people in the group and in those days I wasn't very vocal I was pretty shy so I kind of sat in the back and I think that's one of the things uh, the writers were sitting at a table and one of the things they were like trying to see who's who, because they're going to sit around, you're going to hang with these people all the mm -hmm. time, and you're going to be doing table reads, you're going to be staying up late, and they kind of want to see who, you know, like everybody's writing was good enough to be there. Yeah. But then he goes, um, he goes, we want to see our, we're hiring for a new show, and he hands us a script, and it's Friends. And so I was like, oh my God, so later I was like, oh my God, I just found that in my storage. I was oh, writing. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's the original script for Friends. Yeah. But um, those kind of things. So I would do contests and stuff like that, and, and writing. And um, and then you know I, I put it down, but when I w took this adult ed class in writing, I wrote this chapter, and the teacher said, "Do you want to read it out loud?" And that just terrified me. I think I went in the bathroom, and threw up. You know, I came back, and I was just nervous. And I read it, and she really liked it. And so she sent it to the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, where I thought to be at that conference, you had to be a professional writer. You know, mm -hmm. it was just something that I would see and go, "What well, yeah. I can't do that." 
And so um, when I walked into that room with all of these writers of people who write stuff and stick it in drawers and you don't get back to it, and 10 years later they're like, I'm still working on my book. And I'm like, oh my God, these are my people. <laughs> because none of my friends wrote, not one of them. And they're like, what are you writing for? Like, what are you doing? Now you're writing an Ellen script? Why? What are you doing? And all these kind of things. So, um, so I'd say it was a long time coming. And I've had some short stories published and stuff, but this is my first novel. Mm. I have to say, Margo's a genius when it comes to marketing. We had a contest at the <laughs> film festival of picking a slogan, and she had written 20 of them down before any of us got one. <laughs> she was that quick. And she also beat me in a contest for worst first sentence once, oh. too. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? That was text me Ishmael? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, worst first sentence. I love those. Yeah. So you, didn't, you didn't get your uh, script for The Simpsons? Oh, no. I, I sent it in, but, you know, I kind of I didn't understand how the whole thing worked and things like that, whether they would take. Like, I didn't get an agent, and I just didn't really pursue that stuff. I kind of just did more contests and things to get in there. But I lived in Santa Barbara, and if I was in L.A., I think I would have been more serious about it. It was just kind of something fun to do. Like, a contest would come up, and I'd send something in, and I'd... I'd get into the next level or get a prize or something, and, and it was just kind of a fun thing. Did but, you get a response um, saying that? What's that? Did you get a response from the, the Simpson company? No, I didn't get a response from so that's, them. That sucks. Yeah, so that's yeah, that sucks. So they just suck. Okay. And they're never going anywhere. I'll tell you that. That show is not going to be. No, so um, and I remember writing the cover letter like I was a child, you know, like in that cursive when you're learning cursive or something, just really silly. But um, but anyway, it was fun to write, and um, I did. I just I sent it in there. They probably don't take unsolicited scripts, and I just don't know that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. I don't think they do. Yeah, and so yeah. it was just kind of a thing. I wrote it and sent it in, and and then I had people that I would meet, you know, that were kind of in the industry would do certain things. But I really I stayed here, and I just hunkered down. And then I was working at Big Dog Sports, where where I was a professional sloganator. That was okay. 14 years of slogans all day long. Wow. So I did that, you know, um, all the t-shirts and the funny underwear, you know, like on the men's boxers, it would say, ready to blow. And <laughs> then the dog would be next to a volcano. And I'm like, what do you think? <laughs> so obviously a volcano dog. So we went into the very offensive. We started out as a family company and attitude is everything and think positive like a dog. And then it just kind of slid. And everything, when I came in, they were like, you know what? She's pretty good at the dirty stuff. So uh, yeah, and some of our underdogs had to be put only in the catalog because this one guy came in, he wrote us a note um, on the thing. And he goes, listen, I love your stuff but I brought my grandson in and um, all your underdogs are sitting there right at his level and it was a skeleton with the head off um, and it said need head and he was just walking around going need head grandpa need head need head grandpa need head grandpa and he was like oh yeah so like okay we're pulling him we're putting him only in the catalog they're not in the store but those were kind of the funny things and the world had gone into offensive you know humor we yeah. followed that trade and then we went into blue collar stuff and and uh, like when I did this five o'clock somewhere, I pitched that for three years and they, they were like, we've never heard that before. Oh and I go, God. I'm telling you that when you go on vacation and you're a drinker, yeah. you say that. And they're like, we don't, I don't even know. I, Wendy was there. And um, yeah, and it was like, finally, so three years later, Jimmy Buffett's coming out and I have, it's my job to look ahead and see what's coming out in, the, in music and things. And so we can, um, we can parody it. And so he, I go, he's coming out with an album called, it's five o'clock somewhere. You know? <laughs> and so they go, okay, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it. So it, it just killed, like the whole story of the boss goes, I think I should change the whole company, just five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> but then Jimmy Buffett sued us, thinking I copied it, but uh -huh. I don't delete anything. Yeah. Like if I want to go back and see the very first chapter of this from yeah. God knows when, it's in my computer somewhere. <laughs> like I just don't Dated. delete. So yeah, I found it, I looked it up, so they sent out to court, and then you could see that I had pitched the idea three years before. Uh, prior so we were off the hook but funny, funny stuff. <laughs> are you gonna write another one yeah, yeah what's well the next? next thing I actually think um, my I was a dog sitter for five years and there's a lot of shenanigans there <laughs> um, it's like it's great you get the dogs and then when the owner comes back you have the dog looks good but what happens while they're gone yeah. and the catastrophes the near catastrophes and all of that stuff um, 
And it would be like a misadventures in dog sitting and like things like that. It's like the yeah. And I yeah. met with the, um, <laughs> this woman. She's the head of Harper Collins, and we had we were talking about something. We were talking about this, and she goes, "I'm already doing a rock and roll thing." So I go, "Okay." But she's, I had mentioned I was doing dog stuff. She goes, I will work with you on a dog sitting book. If it was like adventures in babysitting, if you spin it like that with dog sitting. So I've got to watch that, read the book, and then see if that's the direction or something <laughs> like that. But she said to call her when I get started. So I just needed to get this thing checked off and I can go into doggies. Well, Margot Dunbar Hessian, thank you so much. Uh, soaring to new lows. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.